Hello, everyone, and welcome to A Time for Change. I'm Alexis Christophorus. We've all heard of the Grammys, but did you know that the organization behind them is called the Recording Academy? It's a not-for-profit that was founded back in 1957 to support and advocate for singers, songwriters, producers, engineers, and music professionals. And as hard as it is to believe, for the first time in its 64-year history, the organization now has a Black CEO. Harvey Mason Jr. is a record producer and songwriter who is a six-time Grammy nominee himself. We sat down recently to talk about what's ahead for the Grammys and what Mason is doing to make the music industry more diverse and inclusive. To be more representative and diverse is an absolute priority of ours. I think we have set that up. I ran for chair on the platform of change. I was elected as chair and then put in as CEO over the last few months because I feel like the Academy has to be more representative, has to be more diverse. The music industry is uh, made up of a wide variety of people, different genres, different sexual orientations, races. And I wanna make sure that we look like the industry that we represent. And so uh, we've started many programs, the Black Music Collective. We've started women, uh, worked with Women in the Mix and other women organizations to make sure that we're bringing in membership and getting relevant and educated. I mean, the list Lex, goes on and on of the things that we're doing. And I'm, you can tell I'm so excited about it. I feel like we're making great progress. And one of the things you did, Harvey, was for the first time ever, the role of, of president and CEO has been split. You now have uh, two co-presidents, one of whom is your diverse chief diversity officer. Tell us why that structure of management is working and is right for the academy at this time. It's simple. We wanted to be able to be excellent. We wanted to bring great people to the table. We wanted to have talented people in the right places doing the right things. And we had people that uh, we had access to that I was really excited about that we're going to bring unique perspectives and talents and experiences to the table for the academy. This business moves so quickly. The industry, you know, every couple of weeks, there's a few hundred thousand new songs coming out, different styles are emerging, musicians are coming onto the scene. And in the past, the academy had sometimes moved a little sluggish and we weren't able to uh, adapt and change like I, I hope we could. Now with this new structure and with the talent we have in place, we're able to move and we're able to see things and hear and listen and communicate and get things done that we need to get done to represent our members. So in Valicia Butterfield Jones, we've got an incredible talent. She came from uh, another tech company and politics before that and the music industry before that and just has so much insight and wisdom around what's happening in our world today, not just in business, but in culture. And then Panos Panay comes uh, as a, with an entrepreneurial background, also education background. And between those talents and the rest of the staff at the Academy, I feel like we have a great, great team, all really with the main goal of being a high functioning organization. Yeah, I know you called it your dream team. That's for sure. Uh, you know, you talk about, you know, lots of new musicians coming on the scene all the time. I'm curious to your mind, do you think it's more difficult for musicians now to make a living doing their art than say it was when you were starting out? Because, you know, technology can be great and has definitely transformed the industry. But in some ways, you've got, you know, artists making pennies on the dollar on platforms like Spotify with their music. I'd have to imagine it's it's tougher than ever to make a living doing what you love. Technology has been amazing. And we're so thankful for the technology because it gives us access to our fans or to the consumers. We can make music on Friday and it can be out on a Monday. We can also make music on one of these, a laptop, and we can do it in an airplane or in a basement. But it also has created some tension as far as equitable payment. You know, having music on the different platforms is amazing and we consider them our partners, but we also have to figure out a fair way to compensate people who are you know, spending years at their craft and getting uh, enough time writing and creating and singing so that they can actually have a chance to release. And then they finally do release all this blood, sweat and tears that goes into their craft. And then they, as you said, make pennies on the dollar, sometimes less than pennies on the dollar. So we have to make sure that we are able to find a way for artists to be able to monetize their art and continue to make a living. Otherwise, we're going to lose a whole generation, a whole class of great storytellers, great musicians, great singers. Uh, and I'd hate to see that happen just over financial issues. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, do you think that the system as it stands right now is broken? And does the industry as a whole need to, you know, take another hard look at it? The industry absolutely has to come together and take a hard look at it. There's going to be some resetting that needs to be done. There's a lot of changes happening. 
Uh, I'm hopefully very involved in, in pulling together some of the constituencies to try and make a difference as one of my key roles as, as the CEO of the Academy. And I take that very seriously. Uh, I think there have been efforts made and there's been some great outreach. Uh, and I wouldn't say the industry is broken by any means. I just think there needs to be some change and some reset and rebalancing. Now, you are the first Black CEO in the Recording Academy's 64-year history. Any idea why it took so long, Harvey? That's a question for a whole nother show, I think. <laughs> no, I, I don't, but I'm, I'm really honored, and I'm, I'm here to do the work. I'm very proud. I love the Recording Academy. I love music, and I know the importance of music in our society. Uh, so music is important. So this job is very important. So I'm, I'm humbled. I'm honored to do this. And I think the thing to remember also is um, black music and music in general is made up of different people. There's a lot of different groups of people that, have, that collaborate, that, that work together to make what we love and listen to every day and sing along to, whether that's a breakup song and you're crying or you're going out for a Friday night and you're excited. This is what we make. This is music and this is the Academy. And that's why for me coming up as a musician, as a producer, as a songwriter, I'm really, really excited to do this work and work with the Academy to really make a difference. Yeah, I want to talk to you about that. And certainly, I mean, music is the soundtrack of our lives, right? I mean, we could always remember, you know, pin, pin a song to a time in our lives. But I, it, at least I believe your CEO appointment is the first time a music creator is in this leadership position for the Academy. And you are a Grammy nominated music producer, songwriter, for those who don't know. You've worked with legends, Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, Beyonce, Aretha Franklin, the list goes on. <laughs> so, so tell us, how does that experience sort of shape or inform how you're going to lead and how you are leading at the Academy? In a couple of ways. First, I have a totally different perspective because I am one of the members. You know, I represent people like me. And so I know what my experience has been. I know how it was for me to come up and start as a music person and what it took to get to where I you know, found some success and was able to make a living. So I'm always conscious of that. And I'm always cognizant of, of people like me coming into the industry. And the second way it makes a difference is because my whole life, my whole career, I've collaborated with people. I've worked with other songwriters or somebody who plays piano or a singer, and I've had to figure out how to piece it all together. How can I get this person to work with this person? How can I bring the best to the table to make a hit song? And that's really how I'm approaching my work as CEO is really trying to bring the right talent together, trying to aggregate all the greatest of the greats and put them in one room and say, okay, what can we do to be better? What can we do to improve? How can we accomplish what we're trying to do here together? Now, I know you've been in this leadership role for about a, a year and a half, and, and you've already implemented lots of change. But what do you, when you reflect back, what are you most proud of so far in the work you've done? So far, I'm really proud of the service that we've been, we've been in service to the membership. And that service is something I'm very proud of. COVID was very difficult. It was tragic for our industry uh, and our memberships. There were over 20,000 members, and a lot of them came to us and said, I need help. And I'm very proud of the work that the Academy did to help our members and to help the industry at large. I'm also very proud of the fact that we came together with the rest of the industry. When COVID hit and a lot of the music community was struggling, in fact, the entire industry was shutting down, live music, recorded music, touring. I started on the phone with a, a, one of our chair, chairman, Steve Boom from Music Cares, and we started calling all the heads of the labels and streamers and uh, radio and record industry, everybody came together to help raise money to help our community. And I'm very proud of that. I'm also very proud of the fact that the Academy today looks completely different than it did 12 months ago or 18 months ago when I started, both in the form of our staff, totally different, our elected leader, we've, we're completely more diverse in our leadership, our board of trustees, our committees, our membership. We are now representative of the music industry that, that we are working with and that we hope to serve. And Harvey, you also pulled off a Grammy show in March during the pandemic. I know the next Grammys will probably look a lot different. We're hoping to look a lot more normal. Um, and you're looking at a date out in January, but I know it's months away, but any, any thoughts you can share in terms of how you envision that Grammy show looking or, or perhaps being different than past shows? Well, you touched on it. The last show was, a, I don't know how it got done. It was amazing. With all the COVID protocol and the issues that we were you know, facing at that time. Uh, but this show, I hope, can be as exciting as the last one. I felt like the last show was very intimate and had some great moments and amazing performances. But I hope this can be a celebration. 
in honor of the excellence of the music that's happened this year. And there has been a lot of music this year. There's an explosion of creativity, you know, through COVID artists, we're, we're weird people. And when something happens and we go through something it comes out in our music, it just, it, it blossoms. And I think this is a year where you're going to see a lot of amazing music, a lot of creativity coming out of this uh, quarantine. So I think the, the show this year will be very exciting. It will be, uh, it'll bring people together. That's what I love about music. And that's what I love about our show. We'll all get together. We'll listen to great music and hopefully celebrate some great artistry. Uh, we are looking forward to that. You know, we hear time and time again about the Grammy bounce, how it can really help catapult a career. That seems like an enormous responsibility, Harvey. What do you think about that responsibility? I don't think too much about it, honestly. We try and just honor the great music of the year. And also, Alexis, I, I always pull back and I zoom out and I think about the show. Yes, we love giving awards. We love honoring the great music of the year. And we hope that it helps the artists. We hope that, hope that it helps the music community. But we know our show is what generates revenue for the academy so that we can turn around and do the programs we do, the education programs, the advocacy programs, fighting in DC for the rights of music people, the music cares programs and the work we do to give back to the music community. That's what excites me about the show. Yes, I love the performances. I love the glitz and the glam and the size and the event nature of the show, but I'm always thinking in my mind, how is this gonna be the platform for us to do more for the industry and help? When you look ahead to the work that still needs to be done, What's, if you had to point to one thing you'd be able to achieve between now and this time next year, what might that be? I want to be a better partner to the industry. I want to deepen our relationships with the creative community. And I want to expand what we do as an academy around the world to do more good. You know, that's it's probably sounds overly ambitious, but I really believe in the power of music. And I believe we have a platform and opportunity to do something really unique, really special, and, and change something for the good. This has been a time in our world where there's been so much controversy, so much separation and division. I'm, I'm in the mood, I'm in the spirit of trying to turn that around. And I think we can do that through music. And I think we can do that through the Academy. The 64th Grammy Awards will be broadcast live January 31st, 2022 from the Staples Center in Los Angeles. The Grammy Awards recently adopted an inclusion rider that will require producers to recruit and hire more diverse candidates backstage and in front of the camera for next year's ceremony. Still to come, a makeup company founded by women of color for women of color, how the founders got it off the ground. Up next. Welcome back to A Time for Change. I'm Sibyl Marcellus. They say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but for many women of color, finding the right tools, cosmetics, to make you feel as beautiful on the outside as you feel on the inside can be a challenge. This happened to our next guest. She was looking for a natural beauty look for work, but she couldn't find the right nude lipstick. She saw a market opportunity and launched her own cosmetics company after attending Harvard Business School. Joining us now is KJ Miller, co-founder and CEO of Mented Cosmetics. Now, KJ, let's start with the impact of the pandemic on the beauty industry. Now, over the past year, our social calendars were pretty much canceled. Mask wearing became a requirement and many people were working from home. So many women stopped wearing makeup completely. But with masks coming off now, a lot of lipstick is coming back on. How has the pandemic impacted your lipstick sales? Yeah, well, it's a great point that you make. A lot of people found themselves tweaking their everyday routine because of the pandemic. What we saw actually, though, and quite interestingly, was because so many people were still doing this, still hopping on Zooms and Google Hangouts for work, their face was still something that they really had to care about in terms of presentation. So while they may have been wearing sweatpants and pajama bottoms down below, up here, they still were putting on, you know, a great gloss, doing their brows, um, you know, put throwing on a little bit of blush. So we actually experienced a lot of women coming to us and discovering us because our focus has always been on everyday staples. And so what, where I think makeup took a hit and where the makeup industry took a hit last year was in sort of your more glam makeup, right? No one was was uh, walking a red carpet. People weren't going to the club. So you didn't have a whole lot of need for sky high eyelashes and, 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 you know, bold purple lipstick, but you still needed to look good. And so because our focus has always been on everyday beauty, 
we actually saw a lot of customers re-upping with us, which was really exciting. And now that the pandemic, I can't say it's over, we know it's not quite over, but now that masks are coming off to your point, we are seeing more and more women flock to us for our lipsticks and glosses. We actually just launched a new gloss trio that has done really, really, really well for us. So that's been exciting. So lipstick and gloss are instrumental, but what other beauty items have really helped sustain your business in sales? Because like you said, women were wearing makeup, but they were still wearing other beauty products so their skin was fresh for when they would put that makeup back on. Yeah, well, so for us, we have a foundation line um, called Skin by Minted. And we call it Skin by Minted because it looks and feels like skin. And that has actually done incredibly well for us during the pandemic because, again, people were still showing their faces. They didn't want to look like, you know, they had on a full face of makeup, but they still wanted to look and feel a bit better. So, you know, our ingredient story for that product is hyaluronic acid. It's got grapeseed oil. It's got really great stuff because... Like you said, people still cared about their skin. So that's another product that did really well for us. I would say another category that did really well for us was um, eyebrow pencils, actually, because if you're like me, I I know I look like I've got brows on now, but I don't. (laughs) My brows are very sparse. And again, when you're hopping on a Zoom every day, you need the things that are just going to sort of make you look a little bit more awake, a little bit more alive. So for a lot of our customers, that's throwing on their quick foundation, you know, doing their eyebrows, filling in their brows and maybe throwing on a gloss. Now, KJ, your motto is well-behaved women seldom make history. How does that apply to the beauty industry and women of color? Yeah, well, first of all, I love that saying because at the end of the day, I think women a lot of times in business and in other industries are encouraged to be quiet, be meek, be humble, be mild, all of these things that sure, it sometimes can be great qualities, but in business, you know, when you've got to beat out your competitors, when you've got to make a name for yourself, when you've got to make sure customers know why your product matters and why they should want it, that's not the time to be meek and humble and mild. That's the time to make a splash. And, and I think sometimes it's the time to break some rules. And so the way it's helped us and, and helped me specifically was I didn't, I didn't build the business the way I, you know, I sort of thought people build businesses, which is go to manufacturer and, you know, work with them to create lipstick shades. I worked with my co-founder and made the lipsticks in my home and then started sending them to influencers and, and like big name influencers, the Jackie Inans of the world, you know, who have millions of followers and said, Hey, we're new. And, you know, we made this in our home, but we'd love if you could try it and started getting followers, started, you know, people were posting and, and, and talking about the product and, you know, all of these things that, that really helped us, but that no rule book ever said you should do. And certainly if you talk to some beauty executives, they would never say, make some lipsticks in your kitchen and send them to some (laughs) influencers. But that's exactly what we did. We were bold and, and we, you know, made up our own rules as we went. And as a result, we've been able to build a really big and and successful company. And KJ, you secured $4 million in seed funding to launch your company. How did you convince rooms filled with men who don't wear makeup (laughs) that this is a $100 million opportunity, nude lipsticks, and that nude lipstick, I mean, nude is not just a color. There's a whole spectrum of shades that can apply to every single woman of color's skin tone. I mean, it's that kind of a market opportunity, right? Absolutely. And, and you know what, what you just said is exactly how we were able to secure the funding. We, we talked about the numbers. At the end of the day, a lot of venture capitalists are men and who don't wear makeup, but they understand dollars. And the reality is women of color routinely outspend our white counterparts on beauty by upwards of 80%. So they know that there is a large dollar amount attached to Black women, Hispanic women, Middle Eastern women, Asian women, and the beauty that we're spending that money on. And so they want want a piece of that pie. And they know if a brand can come and speak to that customer in a compelling way, that that brand is going to be big. Because while women of color might be a minority here in the U.S., globally, we're not a minority, right? (laughs) Globally, we are the majority. And so... I think um, they were able to latch on to that truth and, and, you know, see the dollar signs. And that's how we were able to, to raise funding. And how important has e-commerce been to your business and what's your projection for the year ahead? So e-commerce has been incredibly important to our business. In fact, we have been online only uh, for the first three years of our business. We didn't start selling into retail into late last year. 
And so uh, e-commerce has been everything. And in the pandemic, I think one of the reasons we were as successful as we were is because we had already built out our our um, website to be, you know, e-commerce first. So we weren't scrambling trying to figure out what do we do with all of our lost sales at brick and mortar. We already were e-commerce first. And so on our site, you're able to see several shade finders to help you find your lipstick, to help you find your um, foundation. We've got quizzes. We've got models of every different skin tone trying each product. Um, we've got tutorials and all sorts of content, which makes our site so easy to shop. And that's why I think we were able to do so well. And I think you're going to continue seeing e-commerce become more and more important to the beauty shopper. Absolutely. E-commerce will only grow stronger. KJ Miller, great to have you on. Thanks so much. Thank you.